This show is taped at La Seine, a space for creation and collaboration. Artists, thinkers, and creators of all stripes tell us what inspires their work, a starting point that takes us into their creative process in their own words. Welcome to Who Inspires You. Mo Clark is a multidisciplinary Métis artist and spoken word poet. She has two albums of words and music, Within, which was launched in 2014, and Circle of She in 2008. In 2013, she directed the 10th annual Canadian Festival of Spoken Word in Montreal, with a focus on Indigenous languages. Her Wapikoni video, Neta Kotan, won Best Music Video at the Imaginative Film Festival in Toronto. Mo facilitates writing, spoken word, and looping pedal workshops in high schools, communities, and with Aboriginal youth. Mo, thank you for coming on the show. Welcome. Thank you. Let me ask you right off the bat, who inspires you? Many, many people, <laughs> yeah. many things. Um, I guess one of my big inspirations is a woman named Rhiannon. Yeah. And uh, she's a vocal improviser, activist, artist, healer, medicine woman, and uh, she's one of my mentors. And how do you work with uh, Rhiannon? Uh, Rhiannon, she does a vocal master training, uh, which base, is based in vocal improvisation, so based off of, uh, I guess, practices and uh, experimenting with voice that she learned doing jazz school and working with Bobby McFerrin and working with different artists. And so I was invited this last year to co-teach, to co-facilitate with her in the year-long intensive, which basically takes place in three different locations in the world over three different weeks throughout the year. And each week has a different theme. And what kind of, you know, what kind of training? What does it look like? More so, what does it sound like? Or what does um, it sound like? Well, it's, it's really about looking at how to be present in the moment yeah. and how to trust the intuition of the knowledge that's stored in the body and in the memory and in the ancestral memory of who we are and where we come from musically, culturally, linguistically, um, territorially, pulling from those sounds and those ideas. And then we create different motifs and patterns that are thought up on the spot, sung, and then other people join in. So for example, one of the exercises is called walk-in orchestra where, you know, you've probably heard like the nylons, a wimbo it, a wimbo yeah. it, right? So we start with a motor. So we start okay. with kind of a bass kind of sound layer yeah. that holds itself. So it's a repeated pattern. Okay. And then somebody comes in and they harmonize with that. So wow. a wimbo it, a wimbo it. And then somebody else comes in and they create an interlocking or a counterpoint up to eight, 10, 12, 16 voices. And so it's really just you know, wow. working with one another, listening, and, and it, it's really about activating a deeper sense of listening, and through that deeper sense of listening, hopefully transformative effects will occur. And this kind of improvisational um, training, can you take that um, approach and use it in, in actual performance? Yeah, so we just finished a week in Hawaii uh, where we were learning about sound healing. So really looking at what are the transformational effects of, you know, this work in the body and in the land and in community. Um, and so we did a performance while we were out there and it was semi-improvised and semi-structured. So still having a few known pieces mm. and the known pieces are the forms as well. But within those forms, we're improvising. And so that was an offering that we made to the public there. And at moments we invited them in to the singing and the sound creation. And, and you know, it's really looking at, I guess one of the most transformative and most global biggest forms is circle singing, which oh, yeah. to me stems from indigenous forms of ceremonial songs 
song, um, African American, and you know all the way from like slave movements um, brought over. Uh, it's global around the world yeah. and that's where you get people singing in unison but again it's improvised forms that they've been given so we'll be doing a performance in uh, montreal in late april when everybody comes here for the last week of the sessions and where can we see uh, you perform where can this well i'm not sure yet where we're going to be performing but uh we're really pleased to <laughs> be collaborating with uh margie gillis as well oh, wow. uh, very the modern dancer yeah exactly so this final week that we'll be doing is all based on collaboration, which is for me a really essential aspect of my work and my practice as an artist. When you speak of collaboration, do you mean with other singers or other forms of um, singing or of voice um, with other cultures? What kind of collaboration? All of the above. <laughs> yeah, I mean, as, a, as an artist and someone who's been doing this for, you know, I've been singing and performing since I was probably old enough to talk. Um, but I guess for me, collaboration really, it, it's about diffusing and dissolving borders. Yeah. Um, so we, we're aware of them, you know, interculturally, intergenerationally, interdisciplinary, um, really looking at how these different forms of collaboration can exist. And by collaborating with people who come from different ancestry, different artistic backgrounds, different forms of, you know, understanding of the world, of territories, mm. um, we can find common places, and from those common places, we move forward. And, uh, and that, that's a large part of, of what inspires me in my work, is, is discovering new identities, new stories, and figuring out how I place myself with that or how I'm different than that. Mm. And it's through that kind of shared um, invocation, shared storytelling, that I also feel like I'm then able to work in different communities as an educator, as a transformer. You actually have worked with, um, in, in performance, with really a wide variety of, of cultures. Um, just last summer, you did the show Transestral at yeah. Place des Festivals, mm -hmm. um, and there were people from Africa and from... Yeah, it was a collaboration with my friend Katia McDissie Warren, who's an incredible composer. She's Lebanese Quebecois, and uh, she had, you know, we'd been working together just very subtly at, um, for Présence Autochtone, the yeah. festival that happens this year was the 25th anniversary. So it's sort of a, an offering, a gift to them. We proposed this project, Transestral, which was basically looking at trance music. Um, so what happens when we create and, you know, continue repeated motifs in sound? What happens to the body, the spirit? How do we connect deeper? What happens in transmission as we transmit, you know, the stories, the sounds, the musical lineages of our ancestors. So Transestral was bringing together powwow music from Western Canada, the Ganawa from Morocco, Inuit from Northern Canada, um, in a two and a half hour, it was only supposed to be two hours, uh, <laughs> semi-structured, semi-improvised collaborative performance with 24 different artists. So wow. it was really each person brought forward their gifts and they were presented and then from there we improvised and other people were able to add and connect and sort of dialogue musically because some people didn't speak the same languages, you know, verbally. Yeah. So it was really beautiful to see how music brought us into a new dimension of communicating. And a, then a beyond language, beyond language. And yeah. then the audiences that came out, you know, we had a Sufi group who were breathing and, you know, moving around and then indigenous community and then Muslim community and and just people from all sorts of backgrounds. So I think it's also about creating these spaces and performance that invite people from different lineages, different histories to come together mm -hmm. and say, I am here to bear witness to this, mm -hmm. and by bearing witness to this, I'm a participant in that legacy and in that mm. continuum. And now let's figure out what are my stories and how do I connect with that? So, you know, the hope is always that the takeaway is I want to see how this compels me to share what I've experienced and to mm. share what my story is. Mm -hmm. Speaking of your story, how does um, being a Métis, how does that um, affect your work? How does it um, inspire your work? How does it, you know, bleed into your work? Ah, how does it bleed into my work? <laughs> I like that. Um, 
I guess for me, it's, it's really about looking at placing myself and giving myself a context for where I am at, yeah. who I am, and what is my place within the larger circle. Mm. Um, you know, I, when I lead workshops, sometimes I say you have to step out of the box in order to step into the circle. And for me, it's really just about, you know, identifying where I come from and who I am ancestrally as well as territorially, like being from Alberta, Treaty 7, having lineage in the whole southern Alberta and Saskatchewan. How does that land play a part in my discovery of my voice mm. and how as well through those relationships do I feel accountable to community, to certain people that I'm working with, mm. to elders, and to this lineage that I'm a part of. So I guess, you know, part of it's being Métis, part of it's being a spoken word artist, part of it's being an educator, mm -hmm. part of it's being a woman. I mean, I wouldn't say that one identity yeah. takes precedence, but it's about looking at how all, all those identities, you know. Do you find that um, you feel you need to represent any of these identities or any of these communities in any way? Do you feel um, people look to you to um, embody um, that identity in any way? Um, to some degree, but I don't ever feel like there's a, a real pressure, like you have to do this, you have to be this voice. I think it's more so through the, the teachings and through the experiences that I've had, mm -hmm. and in particular, like working with elders. Yeah. I'm accountable to them. Okay. And I'm accountable to that higher education that they're giving me mm -hmm. and that we're sharing. And so by that very fact, it's like, I feel responsible to continue to figure out how can I manifest those teachings and that information that I've been given that has been shared with me in my day-to-day -day life and in the work that I do as an artist. Mm. And you know, and I'm grateful for those relationships and I think that's, you know, a big conversation for another day but really looking at and sort of questioning the system and how do we understand and how do we how do we determine what higher education really means. Because for me, it's, it's, it's spiritual, mm. it's experiential, it's not just something you can step between the doors of an institution and suddenly say, hey, I have this certificate, now I'm capable of going here or doing that. And so, you know, I think part of that learning and part of that accountability for me is sort of breaking through some of those standards and, and figuring out how to pave new pathways or how to go back to the old ways in how we understood and looked mm. at higher learning. Mm -hmm. So you do teach in Aboriginal communities. What is your approach to meeting with the youth? What are you trying to do with them? Um, well, I guess for me, it's really, again, comes back to the circle and, you know, narrative and community and collaboration, I usually bring my looping pedal, which is a device that I use when I work solo. And it basically takes sounds that you put into a microphone through your voice and it loops them and records them and then you can layer on top of that. And so I usually say that the microphone is, is like a talking stick. Hmm. And in indigenous ways of being and knowing, a talking stick really signifies hmm. respect, active listening, sharing, support. So it's building these values and building these tools for supporting and, and better understanding and listening to one another, but through fun activity. Yeah. Um, so we'll put the you know, microphone in the circle and we'll pass it around and you know, we might create the tundra sounding landscape. So it invites participants to sort of think about and place themselves within the landscape. What are the animals? What are the sounds of the wind? What's the sound of the ice as it's cracking underneath your feet? Um, and, and we'll create that and then we'll start to tell stories mm. over top of that sound, over top of that soundscape. And, uh, you know, people start to listen in deeper ways and I really feel like the youth have a lot of fun with it because it's just sort of, you don't have to be a vocalist, you don't have to know how to beatbox, you don't have to be a rapper. Sometimes it's just contributing one word, but by contributing one word or one sound, you're, you're becoming part of that community, you're becoming part of that sonic landscape. 
Um, so that's that's some of the work I do. Writing workshops. We watch videos. <laughs> you know, we do gibberish exercises where we invent our own languages. So in conclusion, can you tell us where and when we could see you perform soon? Yeah. Well, there's Nuit Blanche at the end of February. I'll be performing. Um, at Les Métiers des Arts, the Guild of, of Artists, Canadian Artists. So I'm not sure how long that performance will last, but probably <laughs> a long time. And, uh, and then I'm also going to be recording an album with one of the groups that I'm part of called Solawa. So we got a great you know, opportunity to record for free at Radio Canada. So that's Wonderful. really great. And then in the summer, I'm sure there'll be lots of festivals yeah. and you know, other collaborations happening. Looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you very thank much, you. Mo. Thank you. Uh,